Welcome to Deal Talk. I'm Jeffrey Vite, And of course, as usual, we're going to be talking about avoiding dealer tricks or buying smart or maybe financing or how to do your trade-in, different subjects to help you on an automobile or a truck or a motorcycle or a boat. Yep, we do that every couple of weeks with each episode. One thing I've gotten a lot of call for lately is more information about electrics. You know, I'm running out of things. I'm giving you tons of reasons why you shouldn't get one of them stinkers. Uh, I'm telling you, they're just there's just nothing good about them, right? I mean, literally, nothing. Electric power for vehicles is ridiculous, and most people realize it. I drove by the U- U- UCF campus, which is near where I live, the other day, and I got thinking about it, looking at their employee parking and stuff. I wonder how people are going to charge a vehicle at work. Oh, you're not. So if you get out of work and you're out of power, tough. Call a cab or go down to an electric station and, if, you know, wait for a spot. And then when you get a spot, wait for an hour or so while I charge it up right after work. I don't know about you. That's what I want to do after work. <laughs> right? I got thinking about this. So that's just so commonsensical. There's so many things that are just common sense about it that have been coming up. You know, the other solar power may have value compared, you know, it's the same idea. But there are so many issues with it as well. Solar panels and their enemy, hail. Just a month ago or two, a big solar farm was bashed by hail, ruined the whole thing, like 14,000 panels. There's no fixing those. You don't fix them when the hail smashes them. Nope, so they can't recycle them. So they go to the landfill. A month before that, a 5.2 megawatt farm in Arizona was taken out by hail. It's like storing gas next to an oven, right? You can't fix them. You have to replace them. You know, there's been a bunch of these things where the hail just destroys things. You know, what if you have a hail storm on the roof of your house where the solar panels are? Does insurance pay for that? Well, I don't know. I don't know if it does or not. That doesn't even cover so- solar, your insurance. Hmm. Good point. And does it cover, you know how insurance companies are, it will cover everything except for the things that are going to happen. <laughs> right? And it's not free coverage. You know, it's not free to do that. Now, not every place has to worry about hailstorms. I can't remember the last time we had one in Florida. We have, but I, it's been a long time, so not so much here. But you get out in the Midwest, it's an issue. Solar certainly makes more sense than electric batteries, no question about that. You know, they've been talking a lot lately about trucks and how they're going to move the trucking industry and that they're going to mandate it. It seems to be the Biden regime's favorite word. We're mandating it. <laughs> anyway. The, a semi-truck, the average semi-truck, requires two batteries that weigh 8,000 pounds apiece. It takes more power to charge those two batteries than the factory uses that builds the trucks. Yeah, it's crazy. It's just absolute reverse. It's just more, you know, it's like things like, I don't talk about, I try not to talk about politics on this show because it's, in the news every day and we heard it, but it's like immigration, things like that. It has no bearing of sanity whatsoever, but they want to do it anyway. They've decided that global warming is caused by CO2. It isn't. Look at the scientists lately coming out that are saying, no, no, it's not. I'm telling you, tons of, not, not people that research, not activists. I'm talking about the scientists, the people that do the scientific research to find out what the possibilities are. None of them think it's being caused by that. And even if it did, you know, we've talked about it before, you got three trillion trees on a planet. You can have three times the amount of CO2 we have now, and those trees could handle it. But anyway, so we're getting a lot of demands. I'm just running out of things to talk about on, on electric vehicles unless we go over the same stuff, which I do from time to time. You know, here's a story. A lithium battery at an electric bike shop in New York City caught fire and burnt a building and killed four people. And in New York City alone, since the first of the year, 110 people have lost their lives in electric vehicle fires in New York City. Think about that. That's just one city. These fires are no joke. You know, it's not like we're going to fire. It's not like it's a fire and it's hot and we get out. When When an electric battery burns, a lot of times it explodes. But it burns at four or five thousand degrees, not fifteen hundred. They burn hotter 
and and explodes an issue too because that you know you can get killed by something flying thing right there are no simple battery fires nope e battery fires are not simple they cost a lot in terms of in terms of money and, and it just destroys things you know if you have a electric vehicle you're charging at your house and you've got it in the garage and it's charging and it catches on fire you might as well just pack everybody up and go outside because you're not putting that fire out your house is going to burn down period no if ands or buts you're not stopping that fire i mean those electric vehicles they cost too much they're truly dangerous they don't go far enough on a charge plus the auto industry is trying to come up with a solution to help protect resale value that's how bad it is they're trying to find a way because nobody wants these things it's like buying a used phone who wants a used phone a used iphone iPhones are great, but not when they're three years old and the battery's done. Nope, you got to have a battery. They don't work the same without the battery, right? Well, there's no simple fires. They're just dangerous. So, and and these things cost fifteen or twenty thousand dollars more than the same comparable vehicle. They have terrible resale value, so really you end up paying, you know, twenty five thousand dollars more because you get way less for it at the end in terms of percentage than a gas vehicle. They have no saving grace. And this doesn't even count the fact that the th reason you're buying an electric vehicle for global issues, it doesn't help. Not one lick. It doesn't make any difference. I don't care what Greta tells you. That's not true. It's not going to make any difference. That electric vehicle versus gas vehicle. You, they can control the number of people that have a vehicle. If we go 100% electric, only one in four people will have a vehicle. And they'll be able to co control how far you go. So you can't drive across the country with one. You could if you got a week or two to go. Anyway, that's the, what I wanted to talk about on electric vehicles this week. We'll move on right here. If you like the podcast, please take a couple of minutes and do a review on Apple Podcasts or Google Play or whatever podcast source you use. If you've already done a review, thanks so much. Be sure you tell your friends and family about the podcast. They'll save you money, and they'll save themselves money and grief, and you'll be the hero. Those of you who'd like some written material to carry with you when you're out shopping, get a copy of The Informed Buyer from Amazon or Barnes & Noble Nook. It's great notes, so you don't forget to do something or check something right. They'll give you the basics for quick reference. You don't have to fast forward through the podcast, whatever edition that you're thinking of, to get to that point, because you'd have to know what particular episode it was but it'll give you stuff for quick reference and again like i've talked about many times they cost three bucks three dollars you can get this thing for three dollars this little booklet think about that download it to your phone or your tablet or whatever for three dollars how can you go wrong think about that three dollars <laughs> just so simple well this week i thought we'd talk a little bit about the people that are going out to buy a vehicle that are first-time buyers, you know, others that are experienced and, and have credit problems. What do people do, especially right now? You know, it's been tough for the first-time buyers for forever since they started, first-time buyers started going, but low production, low, low pro, you know, product availability on both new and used doesn't make it any easier because they're selling vehicles for more than the actual value right now because it's, you know, supply is down and demand is up and that puts them in the, the sellers in the driver's seat, and so that makes it even harder for a first-time buyer to buy a vehicle. And it's something that, you know, has to be dealt with. You add to this problem the push for electric vehicles and inflation and interest rates and a bunch of other things, credit issues, you know, the economy is ruining a lot of people's credit. They're paying bills and with credit cards. You know, there was, I think it was the first quarter of this year that the American public put $55 billion on credit cards to get by. Sooner or later, it's got to get paid or something, or people go bankrupt or whatever, but something's going to happen, and that hurts the company that had the credit card because they don't get their money, right? It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't grow on trees unless you're, you know, working in the White House. They think it grows on trees, but... And, you know, this is a credit problem, and the rich don't care about the credit problems. This is for you, to the people that aren't rich, to deal with. So... How does a person finance a vehicle for the first time? At this time, many listeners have asked how to buy without the rest of the family having to do a lot for them. That's what they want to know because, you know, of course, you'll get asked to do things for people to help them buy. 
things like a straw buyer and stuff like that we'll talk about. How does a person get a loan with no money down, or at least not much money down, and no credit experience? Most of my podcast episodes address the actions of people already looking for a product. You know, so you're telling you how to act, what to say to the, the, you know, the dealer or the salesperson, you know, how to come back, how to hold back on the money. When's the time to come out with your due diligence? We talk about that. We don't really talk about the first time buyer. What can they do to purchase a car truck? When you have bad credit or your first time buyer, you don't have the same buying strength that someone with good credit has. You don't. Because they know when you have good credit that you can do whatever you want. Whereas if you're a first-time buyer, you don't really have a credit rating yet. You don't have any credit. That situation can seem overwhelming, confusing, and almost hopeless. Really. But buying with your own credit does not mean going into a dealer by yourself. Just because you're buying a vehicle for yourself doesn't mean you have to go in by yourself. If you're new to buying, take someone experienced with you if you can. Key word here is experience. Someone that understands what you're going through. You may think that you can't buy a vehicle because you don't have any form of credit or as you don't have much in terms of a down payment or you don't have a sponsor or haven't been on your job for a few months. No, none of that's true. There are ways, there's always a way to get the job done. None of these mean absolutely no loan. There are variables, obviously, that fluctuate depending on those terms, but Ways around them, in many cases, are there. People are graduating early from high school or college or a trade school all the time and any time of the year now. It doesn't matter. It's not a particular time for this because people graduate all, all the time. So they want to get to work in their field, so they may need a car or a truck or a motorcycle to get the work done or maybe more on the training or education in a new area, so they've got to get a vehicle so they can drive there to finish their education, right? It, you know, it might seem that the first-time buyer subject is cut and dried, but there are new people in the market, and in fact, a lot of what we cover can apply to people in other situations. So this first-time buyer covers a lot of other situations, too. Chrysler, Ford, Chevy, Toyota, Mazda, to them, it's more of a, we will at least talk to you and sometimes give you a small rebate or a slightly easier credit source. They will, they will all make it sound good on their websites about first-time buyer or on TV, but truth is, they don't do much for the first-time buyer at all. Dealers don't really stick their ne- neck out, and it's the factory that handles those programs, and they're just not aggressive about it. They don't really, you know, they don't have enough product, especially right now. They don't have the product. What do they need to be aggressive for? You know, if they, could, if they start trying to hand out vehicles like they used to, they're going to run out, and they're not going to get the top dollar for them. You know, supply and demand. There's always going to be qualifiers like down payment, short term. Sometimes you can only get the unpopular models. There doesn't seem to be much media information out there for first-time buyers. You'll notice if you go on people's websites, yeah, we have first-time buyer. Come in. First-time buyer. We'll take care of the first-time buyer. We'll help you with the first-time buyer. We have a $800 rebate. Wow, big deal. It's a $30,000 car. Most of the basic websites talk about a little... The information is very basic and pretty much the same at every site, every dealer. You know, every manufacturer does about the same program on first-time buyer. There's nobody out there really working to get that business. Like most of the online sites, they promise the lotto numbers, but they only give you the first two numbers. (laughs) You know, so it's like it's not really any help. Leave out the rest of the winning numbers so it's like never having them, right? And, And I remember back in when I was young and I worked for Ford, they had a program called the Special Retail Program, SRP. And what it was, it was just they loosened up the credit required with Ford on the models that weren't selling. And if it was a model that wasn't selling, then you could get financed on that one. But if you wanted some other model, nope, they just wouldn't give you the loan. What does a person do with no former car loan, maybe no former credit at all, maybe you had a credit card, maybe not even that? And in many cases... They have large student loans they are going to be bearing it down on them before long. Dealerships have information, but that's it. And, and there's a lot of different ways to, 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 to deal with it on your own. So most manufacturers have something superficial. It's really superficial. 
He'll give you an example. They list requirements you need, and you'll need to meet them all. So they'll say on a website, well, yeah, we got a first-time prior program. You need to be on the job six months. Well, you might not have been on the job yet. You're trying to get a car to get there, right? That could be one of the, one of the things. To at least $500 in cash that covers plates and registration. You know, they may not necessarily want the sales tax, but a lot of them are going to charge you the sales tax too. That's 1500 Financing may require you to be a, a dealer invoice, you know, or NADA wholesale. So when you're lo- looking at a used car, let's say, all the profit in that used car, they're not going to finance because you're going to have to be at wholesale. You're going to have to pay that money that the dealer makes down in the tax, down in the plates. And so there's always talking about down payment, even though it sounds like no money down, it isn't no money down. There's stuff you have to come up with that just isn't talked about as part of the vehicle, but they are part of the vehicle. You're paying it, sales tax, that's part of the vehicle to you, you know. You can't have any form of bad credit. If you have no credit and you have some bad credit, let's say you're a first-time buyer and you have only thing you've ever had is a credit card you didn't pay right, you're done. Sorry. Yep, you can't have any form of bad credit. That's, you've already set the, that's so important that if you get a credit card when you're young and they give you the first time they give you credit, you need to be perfect on it, literally. Payment to income ratio has got to be, you know, 15 to 20%. Your new job pay will need to provide about five times the vehicle payment. So, in other words, if you're looking at a vehicle that's 350 a month, they're going to expect you to be making 2000 a month. Net. Total debt for all the bills, not over 50%. So if, you, if your bills come to more than 50% of your income, they're not lending you money. Occasionally, a college grad rebate will come up for people who are college grads, but it's a small nick in the payment, right? And, you know, there's, there's things that talk about your character without you knowing it. Those can make a difference. That's why college graduates, they have a rebate because those people have gone through the trouble of going to college. They're more likely to pay, they think. Although statistically that's not true, but that's what they think when they drew up these programs. What does a person just starting out do, right? First, you figure out what you can afford and what vehicle will meet your basic needs. You got to do that. Like in all parts of Deal Talk, we talk about picking out a vehicle, figuring out your budget, not talking price with anybody. That's got nothing. Don't even get into that. You're just picking out the vehicle. Just what you need. You don't want to, you know, in your first time buyer, it's not the time to be worried about mag wheels and sunroofs. Really, that's not smart. That just makes it that much harder to get the loan. You just want to figure out what you need to get by. What will get handle your things, all the needs that you have and the passengers you have and things like that. What do you need to get the basics? Now, once you're approved, nothing could say that you can't say once you're approved to say, well, how about now that I'm approved? How about would they do it on this vehicle instead? And you can find out that way. But to start off with, to get an approval, you want to stay basic on just sensible vehicle that'll get the job done. You can worry about the other stuff later. When it comes to bank loans, the more risk, the higher the interest rate. And usually the shorter the term they give you to pay. Before you go to a dealer, go to the banks and find out what is available. How much can you borrow? What are the conditions they want that you can count on? No matter what the bank tells you, remember each bank is just one answer, and answers can vary dramatically. Banks don't answer on loans or approve loans in the same method. I've seen banks where, where you've got five different answers from five different banks. That's no baloney because they're, that's just, it's subject to people. That's who make those decisions, not machines. You might find a 20% down or a limit of wholesale book on a used vehicle or limit of dealer invoice on a new vehicle is required by the banks. Plus, you need a job before the loan is accepted. So not having a job will be a disqualifier in most cases if you don't have one. But a letter from an employer that says, if you get out here and move out here, we'll give you a job, that's a letter of commitment. That's like having a job. They may get it done. Yep, a letter of commitment may get your loan done. This can help in many situations. Terms may be shorter on that loan, right? Like 48 months instead of 60, a little higher payment. So that what happens is the car's paid off faster and that keeps the debt or the amount you owe in line with the depreciation. So they're always going to be able to get somewhere near what they loaned against it for it if they had to repossess it. They want the principal to be paid off at the same rate as the depreciation in most banks, right? Go to at least three banks minimum. More is better. 
Definitely. Once you know the bank terms, you can go to the dealer and negotiate from a position of an approved buyer instead of a position of help me. I mean, if you've got a bank that's going to lend you the money for four years, this amount of money, and you've got to be near wholesale, now's the time you can go back to a dealer and, and you've got, now you've got weight because you don't, they don't need them to get approved. So now you can deal from a little different position than you would if you had, were depending on them to get you the loan too. Even if the bank shut you out, still go to the dealer anyway. And I'll tell you why. Who knows what kind of influence that dealer might have on a lending institution. You know, there's a lot of positives in that. And you, if you can't get your own money to have the dealer try to, because a lot of times the dealer has his floor plan with the bank. All of his cars are financed with the bank anyway. And he calls the banker and says, hey, man, we need some help on this loan. This is a deal I could use. So, and now a lot of times that pressure will just say, okay, we'll approve it, but you got to come up with this and that. And they might give you some terms that you don't, that are tough, but it's better than no approval at all. But if you already have outside financing available, don't mention that to the dealer. Don't tell them that you're approved on a loan someplace else. You don't have to tell them that. Why, what, what, how does that help you? you we, we sometimes, it's like people paying cash. I'll tell them, don't tell them. They'll say, well, if you're paying cash, doesn't that intimidate them and make them try harder for your money, for your loan? No, it does not. Well, we think it does. It doesn't. If you got approved someplace else at a bank, don't tell them because you can find out what they come up with. Maybe they'll beat the bank's deal. Who's to say, right? Wait until you hear what they can do. What is offered to the experienced buyer would probably be better terms than you'll be offered as that first-time buyer. You know, you're, you're having to pay for the first chance, and that's what it amounts to. You don't have a track record, so they're not going to take as much gamble with you. What if you didn't need the, ter you know, the terms required for the independent first-time buying? You can meet the down payment and upfront dollars required where you don't have the job yet or your income ratios aren't what they've required or, you know, there's a lot of things can, get, can put you in a position where you can't get the loan. There's things you can do that are going to help you more than others. So, you know, having that job, that letter of commitment is going to help you, you know, um, if you if you got a little down payment, that's going to help you. I mean, it's a first-time buyer, even without credit. But what will help the most, the thing that trumps all of this, first-time buyer, or for even somebody with bad credit, is a cosigner. Someone with good credit who will guarantee your loan payment by agreeing that if you don't pay, they will. They call that a cosigner. That is definitely the best way to go for a first-time buyer, if it's possible. One big advantage of a cosigner is the terms of the loan would be determined by the cosigner's credit. So if you get a cosigner, they're not going to they're not going to get a take a cosigner and give you the the terms of a first time buyer. You're going to get that better interest rate and things in a little longer term if you have a cosigner because their bank doesn't have the threat they had of you being a first time buyer. They've got that cosigner, somebody with good credit that says they'll pay if you don't, and that that works. It also makes leasing possible. You can't lease as a first-time buyer, but you can if you have a cosigner. And if you got cash, without cash to put down, a lease is probably a better way to go anyway. Another advantage is that with prior approval of a loan, you could negotiate in, in comparison shop much harder. Cosigners are the best answer to a credit issue, but they can be difficult to come by. So if you got a cosigner, you know you're going to get approved. So you can deal tougher. You can be a tougher sale for them and make them earn your business a little harder than if you didn't have that. As you, as you can see, there are a few different types of opportunities available to first-time buyers. If you have a good job and your employer writes a letter verifying your good outlook with the company, that testimonial presented to your local banker could make up the difference if you don't have quite everything is needed for them to make the approval. Those things carry weight. They don't have it in a book that when you get a letter on the person's background from their employer, you can approve this is worth so many points. No, it just I just know bankers, and it does. It makes a difference to them to know that you've got a testimonial from people you work for. It's, it's important. Okay, so, you know, a lot of it's based on character, especially if you're going directly to a bank and there's a loan officer involved. Character, your character and things have more to do with it than you might think. If you have credit issues, it's tough to get loan regardless or, you know, but for a first-time buyer with poor credit, it would be very tough and darn near impossible. A call signer still will work for a poor credit first-time buyer if the credit issues aren't too bad. 
but it would affect the length and terms and the interest rates. If you got bad credit, you get a cosigner. They may approve the loan, but you're going to have the first-time buyers, you know, the, the rates and stuff that would have been with you without a cosigner if you didn't have bad credit. So, you know, the bad credit really has a big effect, even, especially with a first-time buyer, because that's you're establishing your your uh, yourself. That's your first. That's the indication of what you're going to be like. Another answer to first-time buyers: big down payment, fifty percent down. You go to buy a car for twenty thousand, you put ten thousand down. You'd have to be pretty bad to not get that loan. It balances out the risks for the bank. It it actually trumps the debt ratio thing too. Fifty percent down is a big factor. Now they're going to keep your. Ter- they're still going to keep your term short, so that they're ahead of what's owed. They 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 just want they want to get you know things back for sure, and they're not taking any risk at that point. What if you just can't wing the first time buyer deals as they're presented, and they come up with all the things you have to come up with, and you just can't get it. You just try, you go all the, do all the things you can. You try, you can't get a cosigner. You can or you couldn't come up with a down payment. They just couldn't get past the down payment. Whatever. Maybe you lack whatever it is, you know, uh, the money to pay for the dealer fee and the taxes, or you know, maybe your debt ratio is out of whack because, you know, you, you're, you're, you've got a family member that lives with you or something. Uh, what do you do then if you just can't meet it? Well, in that case, and that case only, there's always buy here, pay here. Because I guarantee you, I, you know, if you're first, every first time buyer in the country can get a buy here, pay here, but it's going to be higher interest rate. Not as good a quality vehicle. It's going to be an older vehicle. It's going to be a high interest rate. And they're going to have you pay bi-weekly. And they're strict as hell about it because of the experience they've been through. It's definitely the last resort, you know, the crazy high rate and stuff. But it's better than nothing. If you've got to have a vehicle to get to your job or you don't have a job, well, then the buy here, pay here is better than nothing. They only do used vehicles. But if you need a vehicle and don't have the cash... That's where you got to go. If you have to go, that's where you have to go, right? Many buy here, pay here dealers are good people. They're not bad people. They get their reputation of being that way, but because of who, what they deal with and who they deal with. But uh, you just check the Better Business Bureau, and, and if it's an absolute must for a buy here, pay here dealer, check their background. Great way to get things going until you handle the criteria. So you get a buy here, pay here, you pay on it until you get to the point where you can get your own credit, and then you sell it and get out from under it. Another answer to your problem, first-time buyer, is to get a cash-used vehicle. If you don't, ha- if you have some cash but can't arrange the credit, let's say you got two thousand dollars, you know, cash, they're out there, but require careful search. Follow the ideas on the episodes about buying a low-priced used. I've covered them on a couple of different episodes. Two thousand cash, and they're out there, and you can get some cars that are okay at two thousand dollars that'll last you at least long enough for you to be able to get yourself in a position where you can buy something. In the larger metro markets, there are dealers that will sign what's called recourse. You're not going to see that in small towns, but you'll see that in big metro markets where it's very competitive. Recourse means they're telling the bank they'll co-sign, and a dealer agrees to repossess and pay off the loan to the bank if you do not pay. So you know, what they're saying is, okay, well, if he doesn't, this customer doesn't pay, we're going to pay off the loan, Take the car and we're going to and we're going to sell it, do whatever with it. But you won't have to. Where the bank won't have to worry about it. I mean, why would a dealer do that, right? The obvious answer is a huge profit on the vehicle you buy. That's one reason they get are making a big profit on the vehicle, so they're going to do it that way. And you're usually limited to used vehicles because the dealer owns those. In most cases, new vehicles are on floor plan. They're financed with the bank, but a lot of times the used vehicle inventory is paid for. So they're going to do it on that one. They're outside, outright purchases, and so that risk is, you know, affordable. And that's why they'll do that. They'll sign a recourse with the bank. Doesn't mean you're definitely going to have it, but the bigger markets, big metro markets will have recourse dealers. You know, they're pretty strict, and it's going to be, they're not going to talk about price or anything with you. You're just going to pay whatever that, because it's, all that's going to be ruled by the bank. So they can't charge you way too much, too much. Because the bank has limits to that, right? Even if they're going to co-sign. They don't, banks don't loan money planning on repossessing or buying back or all that stuff. They don't want to go through any of that. They don't want any of that. They want a situation where nothing ever happens except they get paid monthly like they're supposed to, and that's what they're looking for. 
There are key points for a first-time buyer. Number one, figure out your absolute for sure budget. How much can you actually afford? Next, what minimum in a vehicle is required? What do you absolutely have to have? Do you have to have five sets of seat belts? Okay. You have to have four doors? Okay. But you don't have to have a sunroof. You don't have to have a stereo system, a fancy stereo system. You don't have to have mag wheels. Keep it simple. What's the minimum you could get away with? What options would be nice but not required? You can make a list of those, but they're not required, so you keep those separate. Strengthen your credit worthiness with an employer letter. If you can get a letter from your employer saying how good you are, get that. That's powerful stuff. No question about it. Other testimonials can help, too. It's like, for instance, if your minister of your church will write a letter about you or someone else that's well-known in the community that owns a business, maybe, that'll help you. Is a cosigner possible? There's nothing more powerful than that. A cosigner, a person with good credit that will sign with you, that's the most powerful thing. Shop the banks, loan companies, credit cards, as many as possible, and get prior approval if possible. Remember, some credit cards will loan money, like Capital One loans money on cars. But they're known as a credit card, but they do loan money on cars. You never know. Find out where it is. Where, where everybody, get the whole story. Don't give up. Talk to as many banks and credit unions and loan companies as you can. Don't give up. Once you have the credit handled, pick out a vehicle. Negotiate regardless of the financial situation. Always negotiate. Don't ever take it laying down unless you just have nothing and it's just, and it's just you don't have anything. I don't have any down payment. I don't have anything. I don't have any credit. You know, and if you have bad credit, just the same ball game. You have bad credit. The big thing with a person with bad credit is to have an explanation. What's the explanation that explains why you have bad credit? They go in and say, I don't know, I just didn't pay. That's not going to help you. You've got to have an explanation as to why your credit's bad. Something that's real and believable and really happened. Why you have bad credit. And an explanation of why it won't happen again. That's powerful stuff. They're going to want to know that. Otherwise, they just don't take the chance, right? Another thing you can do is, the last one, which in some states is not legal, if I remember right. Okay, where I live, but it's called a straw buyer. A straw buyer is a person that goes in and buys a vehicle in their name and lets you use it. I, mean, I don't know. That's way out on the wing. That's past cosigner. That's crazy. You know, you go to buy here, pay here before that, but they, it's, you know, people do it. It's not supposed to be legal, but they do it. In some states, it's not. Once you obtain credit, don't just sign up, read everything. Ask the selling dealer for a better price at least once. Just because you're doing buy here, pay here doesn't mean you can't say to them, look, well, can't you do any better on the price? If you don't ask, you're not going to get. So do it anyway. He may say, no, nah, that's it. That's the deal. Take that to deal where it is or leave it. And then you got to go with it. But find out. If it's used, you still need to see a Carfax. Don't drop the other things by the wayside because you have weak credit. The weak credit's another point. It's got something. It doesn't take the place of everything else. It's just an additional thing you have to deal with. You still want to see the car, the Carfax. You still want to have it checked by a tech. You still want to know what the warranty is. And who's the company that's representing the warranty? Evaluation techniques are the same in every situation. doesn't matter what it was, what it is. As far as electric vehicles go, no way. If you have limited credit, new credit, any kind of possibility of limited money, you don't want an electric vehicle. They're expensive. They're going to be expensive to service. They're expensive to buy. There's no saving grace. It's just going to cost you more money that you don't have. So stay away from that stuff. That's what you do about credit for first-time buyers and, and bad credit. Those are the things that will help you. Well, that's Deal Talk for this week. If you have a question or a request or even a comment, please call or email me. Callers, dial 407-801-4071. That's 407-801-4071. Or email me at dealtalkpodcast at gmail.com. Please don't forget to tell your friends and family about the podcast. You'll be helping them. They'll save some money and get a better deal because they listen to the podcast, and then you'll be a hero, and that's important. Be sure when you're going to listen to the podcast, if you bring it up, that if you get some other program that's called Deal Talk, because there have been a couple of people trying to steal the name of the, my podcast. 
if that comes up, that it's a picture of a red and blue car with a microphone in the window. Yeah, don't, you know, there's these, some people just have no ethical background at all. They're just terrible. But get a copy of The Informed Buyer. It's three bucks. It'll save you a lot of headaches. However I can help you, contact me, and I'll, you'll hear from me. Everybody does. I'll get back to you, I promise. And remember, every payment you get should be CPI, complete payment information. You should know the amount, the months, the rate, any required down payment to get to those terms when they quote your payment. And not just the first time they quote your payment, but every time they quote your payment. You need to know how many months the payment's based on, how much money was it based on. Do you have to come up with any money down to get down to that number? You don't want them surprising you and you're getting ready for delivery and saying, oh, by the way, that's 2000 down. Well, you never told me it's 2000 Well, heck, that's how we got to the payment. But you didn't know that. No, you want to know going in. That's important. And every cash price you get, if you're going to do your own financing and pay cash, well, then you want an all-in price, every single cost required to buy the vehicle, right? You don't want them to tell you 20000 plus fees. No, no, no. Give me the total number, the vehicle, the tax, the plates, the dealer fee, any aftermarket engine. What's the total out-the-door dollar that I have to come up with, right? They call it OTD. 